I'd like to try and re-inspire you with um, some resources that um, the University of Waikato have been building around Wikimedia resources. So that includes Wikipedia as well as Wiktionary. Um, and I'll just, because my, my teaching background is in the traffic of purposes more recently in the UK, there are a lot of issues around is Wikipedia good enough to be used in that context, in that teaching context? So I'll cover that as well. Okay. So just as a, um, a quick overview, so I'll be talking about some of these misconceptions around Wikipedia in English for Academic Purposes, which is also known as EAP. Um, I'm going to also do a live demonstration of some of the FLAX collections from the University of Waikato using Wikimedia. And FLAX stands for the Flexible Language Acquisition Project, which I'll be showing to you soon. And um, also, which is of really great importance to my work, is um, using open channels for trying to push out these open resources for language learning and teaching, which do not have to be in English. We have the tools um, to do these in any languages, and I'll try and make reference to that throughout as well as um, trying to reach those teachers and learners by showing them, okay, what, what are the projects that you're doing with Wikipedia? Because people just don't know. It's not part of our formal training. We have to use informal training methods to try and push this out. And in the next year, I'll be doing a lot of traveling around the world and hopefully working with the British Council to try and push the sorts of things that we're doing. So me being here today is um, hugely um, enriching of my, my teaching practice and what I hope to share with other teachers out there. Okay. So, misconceptions about Wikipedia and EAP. I've just recently, uh, Nottingham University started a master's program in English for academic purposes and they have a blog. And um, part of their blog, just to kick off in May, was 20 myths about EAP. And the top myth was that Wikipedia was a reliable and valid source for teaching English for academic purposes. Now, I think there's a lot of mistrust, a lot of misunderstandings around what Wikipedia can do or does do in higher education. And me being here today, I'm hopefully going to try and push back in this blog context, but also across this community of EAP practitioners, exactly what the benefits are and the dreams around Wikipedia, as well as being mindful of those nightmares which have just been raised. Um, so I'll just um, click on. Um, my background also um, covers the area of something with um, corpus linguistics. So corpus, for those of you that don't know, is a large collection of texts or a body of texts. That's why we use the word corpus. And um, with the people at Waikato, they have been using a lot of corpus technologies to text mine Wikipedia, as well, as well as linking those resources to other language collections, which I will demonstrate to you. So one of the big um, complaints from the English for Academic Purposes teaching world is that the texts in Wikipedia are not lexically dense enough to resemble academic writing. And because there's this understanding, which I think is a correct understanding, that Wikipedia is an encyclopedia resource. So a lot of the language is going to be from the genre of explanation. But I'll show you today that yes, there are many of those types of texts, but we also have texts in Wikipedia which move towards the essayist or discursive genres. And I'll just show you um, how I can prove that to you. And then I'll go into these collections with facts to show you what we've been doing. Okay, so today's featured article on Wikipedia was about Sebastian Shaw, for those of you who have seen it already. Now, um, I'm just going to go in there, and I'm going to um, copy I'm going to take it over to um, an online site called The Complete um, Let's Get Tutor. And in this website, we have some useful language analysis tools. And one of them is called the Vocab Profile. I know it's a very busy interface. Uh, I'm just going to demonstrate to you something about this text on 
on the feature page of Wikipedia. I'm just going to paste that in, and I'm going to analyze it in terms of vocabulary that's in this text. Okay, so what we have is, um, we have the text here on the left, and an analysis of the text on the right using different colors. Now, if you go up to the um, analytical data, we have these words in blue and in green, and they are the first 2,000 words in English um, from what, what's called the general service list. Okay, so if you're learning English, um, these would normally be the words that you would cover in high school to make take your high school um, exams. Okay. Then we move into the yellow and the red words. The yellow words are quite important because that comes from what is known as the academic word list. So within Corpus Linguistics, um, a woman called Apple Cox had uh, a decade ago, this was her master's thesis, she built a corpus, a large collection of academic texts, and she built on top of this general service list what was known as the AWL, or the academic word list. And what it says is that these words occur across all of the disciplines, okay? And if it's an academic text, normally you would be hitting around about 10% of the yellow words in that text. Now, I'm not quite sure if you can see that, but um, the AWL words in this feature page out of Wikipedia are only hitting at 3.3. And so this is very much writing from that ex um, explanation genre. But I'm not saying that this is true of all Wikipedia articles. So, for example, um, just to find a different one, I, I looked up the word revolution this morning. It must have been the mood, the mood I was in before coming to this conference. And same thing again. Um, in fact, I'll just do control A and see if that works. Oil, um, and so on. So coming over to the flax 
website. Because the people at Waikato are um, open source digital library software developers, they are not referring to these large collections of text as corpora. They are referring them to them as connections, which is probably a, an easier word for people to get their heads around. Okay, so within this project, we've got, oops, we've got different, different collections. I'll show you two collections very briefly. The first one is learning collocation. So any language teacher here would know what a collocation is. Um, does anybody would like to volunteer the definition for what a collocation is? Okay. In so the same place? Yeah, yeah, because there's a location issue. Um, basically, it means words that go together. Okay. So if I was to say to you, what words go together with economic? Can you give me a few examples? Crisis. <laughs> disaster. Disaster. Yeah. Melt, meltdown. <laughs> recovery. <laughs> boom. Okay. So just So what, <laughs> what they've done, so you are going to put this word economic in. And notice here, it's a very simple interface, but I have a choice of three language collections. We go with the uh, BNC, which stands for the British National Corpus, or the BOR, which stands for British Academic Written English Corpus. <coughs> and the reason why we have these three collections is to show students as well as teachers how is this word, economic, used across different contexts? And um, let, let's start off with Wikipedia. Okay. Okay, so automatically, we, yeah, yeah, economic development. Damage beyond economic repair. So I uh, think that little um, box that's come up, but that's showing you the pattern of language. So what we've done, what they've done, is they've put this open source parsing language to analyze the language of Wikipedia and to sort that out according to patterns, okay, which is quite helpful. So, and here we can see that economic is an adjective, but we've also got family words, which is very useful when you're teaching um, academic English or just general English to students to know how the words are formed. Um, but really interestingly, we've got these related collocations. So the Wikipedia mining tools at Waikato have not only looked at economic used in a phrase, but they've also, got, they've also been able to identify when the word economic occurs across an article, what other words are coming up frequently. Um, and this is a really great way for students to brainstorm a topic. Um, and then we've got de definitions from Wiktionary, and then we've got related topics in Wikipedia. So we just sort of scroll over them, and the language appears. Okay. And then students can decide if they want to go deeper. So I'll just click on that first one. And so this is all using text mining. Um, tools. Okay. The, the really good thing about Wikipedia as a corpus, as a collection of English, or all of those other languages, is that we have a dynamic collection of language. This is not language stuck in time. This is language that's constantly being added to, being crowdsourced, so we know how this language is developing and how people are using these terms. Also, students can just click on this cherry item, add a collocation, and that's so they can store what they've been looking at. And they can print that out, or they can um, <coughs> save it um, here in the class as well. So that, that's just a brief introduction to the Learning Collocations Collection. So here, um, we have a four collection. I'll just bring that up. Now this collection of texts was put together by some very, very knowledgeable um, linguists here in the UK, um, Hilary Messy and her colleagues. And um, basically what they did is they collected 2,700 um, writing assessments from UK students in undergraduate as well as taught master's programs. And, um, 
to show how language is being used by students here in the UK who were awarded an A or a B grade. And I think one thing we have to really remember is that with academic English teaching contexts, we're not teaching our students to write for an academic journal, unless they're PhD level and trying to sort of um, focus down some of their academic um, <laughs> research for, say, their dissertation or their thesis. We are trying to get them to write according to the assessments. Okay? So um, the thing I would like to say there is across all of the genres, according to this research, Every, every genre and every discipline um, here in the UK, and I think that would be true of the world, they all use the language of explanation. So writing in Wikipedia is useful because we do need this skill of explaining a concept, um, focusing down the concept. So there is definitely room for this. And um, I'll just go back and actually show you inside. Um, yes. When you say you've got Wikipedia in Okay, yeah. Is that the whole thing of four million in the passport or what's it? It's the whole thing. And it just <laughs> so they've got a they've got a Wikipedia database over at Waikato and they have these tools and, and when a student has a query it runs through the corpus or the collection. And so that's a way that we found that Wikipedia as a dynamic resource that's been crowdsourced by human beings was a really great valuable resource to link to something like the BOR or the BNC, which are collections that are stuck in time. Okay, so the BNC, for example, was collected from the 70s until the 90s. It still tells us a lot about English language, but it's pre-blog, pre the blog era, pre, uh, you know, pre-blog internet language. So linking these resources in terms of digital infrastructure helps to enhance them both ways. Okay, um, so I'm just going to show you um, really quickly uh, let's look at the life sciences connection from the four corpus. Okay, let's look at this first one. So notice how um, done it. we've got 13 genres. These are the 13 genres that the researchers came up with for academic writing. So when you talk about objective versus subjective writing, it might be better to actually look at the genres and think, what are our students actually being asked to do in the university context? So let's take a look at the thrombolytic event. study put together by a medical sciences student. And once again, we've got this, these passing um, tools to identify, say, a noun phrase, and then we can click on that and link back to um, dictionary resources, thesaurus resources. And we've got also this with a thigh function, okay? So, and this will link us back to Wikipedia once again. So this is a really great way for students to make inroads into how students here in the UK write and what's being expected of them, plus linking to other resources that can come about. Okay, so I'll just move back really quickly. If those of you here are interested in text finding, I've got a little blurb on how the term frequency inverse document fre frequency scores uh, arrived at within these tools, um, for those of you that are more into the technical side. Um, the Oxford Text Archive at Oxford University Computer Services has been amazing with giving us access to the Ball Corpus as well as the British National Corpus to do this work, to open up these collections, because there's no PAP teacher that I know out there who would know how to do anything with the XML files in the Oxford Text Archive that are the board and the UNC board for them, okay? Because teachers just don't have that technical expertise. So we try to open these resources up um, so people have access to them. Okay. And then finally, um, I've been doing some work with Russell Stannard. I mentioned him earlier. He does a lot of work around um, doing screencast capture of a lot of um, web resources for language learning and teaching, not just English. So I'm working with him at the moment developing some flex training videos because teachers need to know what do you do with this stuff and what does it mean? Because when they come to the Flex interface or that Lex Tutor interface, I'll probably do some more work with those later, um, people just don't know what to do. So, and once again, pushing out through open channels, but also for, through more traditional channels like the British Council um, 
and this other group here in the UK called BARD, which is the British Association for Lecturers in the AP. But they're trying to go global, but they really do need to go global. And consider those online learners, those people that can't afford to come <coughs> to the UK to study EAP, because we are really dealing with the, the mobile elite when we're talking about students here in you know, brick and mortar institutions. Okay, so that's pretty much all I had to present to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a comment first of all about the, 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 the technique that you used on the um, vocab profile? Um, right. One of the things that you might not be aware of is that very often featured articles that go onto the main page have a specially written blurb for them. Okay. So you might not, if you use that as you to test, you might not actually get a flavour of what it says in the article itself. Because right. it's not necessarily the lead. It's written deliberately for the lay audience who look at the right. look at that page. So you just talked about the first blurb yeah. that I copied. I'm afraid so. Yes. Yeah, the no. bit that says yeah. the bit that goes down to the word more yeah. is the blurb right. for the right. featured article. Well, uh, now, when I, I did it this morning, I did the whole thing, but just because I was demonstrating right. it to you. Yeah. I was just going to say. Yeah. I mean, I've just had. I've just done the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, what did just you do? Done the same. Yeah. Um, using the lead yeah. of it, um, you get very similar results because. Whoever wrote the blurb more or less pinched the lead. So it did turn out to be the same. But interestingly enough, when I did Revolution, yeah. Revolution had a, a smaller percentage of K1 words. Right. But, uh, sorry, so it, sorry, Revolution had a bigger percentage, sorry, of K1 yeah. and virtually no K2. <laughs> Just taking the lead that, of Revolution. That's, that's very common. Um, um, 25% were the AWL words. Because revolution itself is an AWL word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, we've got the office words as well in red. So this is, this is 
breakdown from the revolution because I can't remember. Yeah, but unfortunately you, you, yeah. you picked everything, yeah. which includes the references and all right, the other stuff right. that's on there. I just did the lead, which yeah. is comparable to what you did for the other one. Right. And okay. you'll find that the A W L is actually twenty five percent of the okay. lead. So what somebody has done is because we tried to make the lead easily readable, that bit, that yeah. first part is the bit that gets people into it. And it should be an overview in itself. But you are also saying that the lead-in for the Revolution article is very high with the AWL, aren't you? Yes, but yeah. it's also very high with the K1. And what's, what has actually yeah. happened is they've removed the K2 words and substituted AWLs. <laughs> Literally. Which is what we... What, what exactly what's happened. What I'm trying to make is that mm -hmm. you can do that as an EAP teacher. You can guide your students to do that. This is how you can get more lexically dense academic vocabulary into your writing. So people are not going to, you know, say, oh, you know, that's just Wikipedia, and that's very, um, very lowbrow language. So there is a way of, I mean, that's your argument with the nightmare as well, that this is becoming too academic. But if you are using it for academic purposes, then maybe you would want to do that in a very explicit way. How can you embed, like, what's, what's the synonym, synonym for this? Simple word, you're saying a more academic word. Right. So that, that is the point I'm trying to yeah, make. I actually go yeah. through Wikipedia exactly the opposite. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Okay. Um, but then you have got these rogue um, pages, like the revolution one, which yeah, I feel is more I'll be working on that later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you took it at like a half a year or two, what type of percentage would you expect to be kind of it, it would be above 10%. So, so the question was, you know, what percentage of AWL would be in academic published writing? It would be above 10%. Um, yeah, also, um, the Magnus Mayhem and the one that um, John Beasley Murray did for UBC, I looked at those, and they were also very heavily referenced in fact, so they're only hitting about 8% on the AWL. The one that the woman this morning in the keynote presented about vocabulary development that's 8% also. I mean, I'll just do just a very quick sort of lens into the type of vocabulary structures that are coming into Wikipedia. It's just a point to make to our community so that they don't just diss Wikipedia entirely. But I mean, I guess this conference is about how do you want it to go? Yes, do you want to simplify it? Absolutely. Or do you want there to be a space where there's a different genre of practice going on with writing? Because this is writing to the world audience. So I think there's a case for that as well. I'm sorry, what, yeah. what are K1, K2? K1, K2. K1, K2. K1. K1. It's the first thousand and the second thousand most common words in English, according to a general service list which was made in the 1950s by a guy from the West. Um, and then you've got the AWL. Office words, interesting, are that the words that are subject specific? Okay, so those are also very valuable, and we do have tools within the Corpus Linguistics, which are open tools, which help us to identify what are the really common words in your field. And that's another thing that we can be telling our students to be, you know, if you're writing for economics or law or engagement. Yeah, try and use the language. Like, you do it. If you're an academic, you read those phrases and you know what's common to your field. So I know in open education, affordance quite often pops up, doesn't it? Um, but we will pick that up through reading. But you can use these tools to help you do it in five seconds. You can do it with a highlighter and paper and take forever, or you can do it really quickly. And if you're a teacher trying to help your students with law, business, life sciences, and those are not your content areas. These are a quick way into um, deciphering what is the language of this particular discipline. Yeah. Can you ever scroll down on the screen to see the text again? So I guess then if you wanted yeah. them to simplify it, yeah. are you effectively saying yeah, you, you want to go through and look at red words and yellow yeah. words? And yeah, you can go the other way. And yeah. I mean, this might be a useful tool for you to simplify Absolutely. Get rid of those yellow yeah, words. Well, well, yeah. That's great. I'm happy that it helps you what you need to do as well. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as I can see, I feel like the off list words are much more serious than the yellow ones. That's because um, the red words you wouldn't necessarily find, um, say for example, Jack Goldstone is obviously somebody writing in that field, right? right? And social economic, you can see that being relevant to the social sciences, but it's not necessarily going to be relevant to 
the life sciences or yeah. the physical sciences. So what the, what the AWL does is show you the common words across all the disciplines, but the red words will help you to identify what's specific to your particular area. If I'm writing for a bright student in, who's aged about 15 to 16, yeah. it doesn't matter that they say Jack Goldstone, I recognise that as somebody's name. And if they're notable enough, I believe they're linked. And I can go and find something else about Jack Goldstone. They don't need to know who Jack Goldstone is That's right. in order to understand what's there. But if they see the word extra constitution and they don't understand what that is, you're going to have a break there in their learning process where they have to go off somewhere else and find out what that word means in order to understand that sentence. And that's the bit that I'm trying yeah. to get rid of. Okay, but I would suggest they go to Flex and then they see how, you know, was it on extra constitutional is yeah. used? I'll just click on the link. Or, or they'll double click it and do a Google search and yeah. get down the But that's what people do. We're trying to mimic that behaviour yeah. of what people do. Um, in terms of like just throwing something into Google, but we're trying to clean that up so it's a little bit more helpful for language learning. But yeah, very good point. Just we need to wrap up there, I think, in the next session. So thanks very much, yeah, thank you.